chapter 3. We talked about the last time we were together, uh, we talked about um, something going on in the Garden of Eden, this introduction of uh, uh, the sin that entered the world. What also entered with sin, uh, as we read about this uh, uh, happening in Genesis 3, verses 9 and 10, I'm going to summarize now because we're really in verse 13, but I'd like to back up just a little bit so that we can understand what's going on. Uh, in verse 9, Vayikra Adonai Elohim et Adam Vayomer le Ayaka, and the Lord called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? Vayomer et Kocha, Shema Atai, Bagan Vayira, Ki Irom Anochi Vayachev. And he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Fear entered with sin. There's a direct correlation between these things that happen in our life when we are in sin and fear enters in. Fear comes right in at the same time that sin entered the world. Now, I've preached many, many times on this that fear is the point man for all other spirits. Fear is the usher, the gatekeeper, the one that keeps the door propped open you can come up here during a healing service or any time after our service for prayer about depression, about arthritis, about uh, anxiety, about all these other things. But and we, can, we can bind and speak to that broken leg and have that broken leg healed. And you can walk out the door. And if you don't bind fear and kick it out of your life, then all those things revisit. We know that story in the Bible that Yeshua talked about that he cast out a demon and the demon left and went out to an arid place and he didn't like it. Well, he came back and he found the house was clean. Clean meaning uh, empty. And it was in order. And he came back and he brought seven of his friends and the man was worse off than he was before because you can cast these things out, but if you don't replace it and fill it back up with the Ruach HaKodesh, with the Holy Spirit, then you leave yourself open for all kinds of things. And so unless we kick fear and close the door on fear, it's, a, it's an open door, it's a revolving door for all kinds of affliction. People keep revisiting, 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 Say, oh, I've been struggling with this addiction, I've been struggling with this pain, I've been struggling with this problem. And I'll look them right in the eyes and say, what have you done about fear? Oh, well, you know, I'm afraid of dying, I'm afraid of this, I'm afraid of that. Well, we need to deal with the fear and when we close the door and we click that lock on fear, it's got to take all of its friends with it, and now we replace it with our hope and our trust and our faith, and we don't walk by sight, we walk by faith. This is the walk we're supposed to be given. Listen, what was it so attractive about the tree of knowledge of good and evil that caused Eve to succumb to just the slightest bit of temptation, the slightest bit of argument, the slightest bit of someone refuting the Word of God. What was it? Was it the most beautiful tree in the garden? Was it so pleasing to the eye that she was drawn to it because she was a sight walker, not a faith walker? Listen, there's many things in our lives that are attractive to us, but those aren't the things that are most beneficial for us. This is the trapping of the world. These are these companies that use the beautiful people, the uh, uh, most uh, elegant women uh, to lure men to buy women's products. So if you buy this product, you'll look as beautiful as this model. Well, that's the subliminal message. It doesn't say if you buy this product, you're going to look like this model. What it does, it creates an image. And we begin to imprint that image upon ourselves. We begin to look in the mirror and apply that image to ourselves and say, oh, well, I'm not attractive enough, but if I buy this product, it'll make me more attractive. I'll look like this model. I'll look like this person. And so that's that sight walk, not a faith walk. How many of you believe that God made you ugly? That God creates ugliness? No. No. When our inner beauty radiates in our light, what reflection do we have? We read in the book of Revelation that the streets were aligned with such pure gold that you couldn't see your reflection in it. But it wasn't about the purity of the gold, it was about the purity of us. It was about the purity of the light that was in us because the reflection, light doesn't have a reflection. You can't see the light 
in a reflection. You can see it bounce off a wall if you hold it into a mirror and you look over there, but as far as light having a reflection, it's just so pure. And so when we think about that, when we look into the beauty and the richness and the purity of this gold or street, and it's so pure, it doesn't mean that it's transparent. It means that you are transparent, that the perfect reflection of Messiah is within you. You know, this whole idea of the story of creation where God formed the light and created the darkness. He formed the light of His Shekinah glory. He formed it so that it would come into the world, this light. Let there be light. And there was light, and God called the light good. The light overcame the darkness. Yeshua said, I am the light of the world when I am in the world. He's not in the world anymore, is He? How many of you know that He's sitting at the right hand of God interceding for you? Well, if He's not here, then what's left? Well, that light. He said, let your light so shine so that man would see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. This is that light that all of us share in. When we open our hearts to receive the Messiah, we receive that light. Now, what happens is, is you immediately get excited and enthusiastic, and, oh, I'm a, I'm, I'm a new creation, and then what happens, that light begins to fade because the world did not perceive it. The world did not receive it. You have these arguments about evolution and creation. You have all these arguments, man, science, this and that, and you're an idiot if you believe in, in the... Listen, you're an idiot if you don't believe in Genesis and you believe in the Messiah. That's foolishness. The very foundation of the world, the very foundational truth of the Bible and Messiah is given to us in the first, what, 10 or 11 chapters of Genesis where this entire story is built upon through the rest of the Bible. It's foolishness to say, I believe in the Messiah, but I don't believe in the Bible. How can you possibly justify your faith? Timothy says, have a ready answer for the hope that begins, that, 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 that's inside of you. Be able to give a ready answer. Have a ready answer for this hope. Your hope was birthed in the creation of the world when God brought the light into the world, and the light overcame the darkness, and He called the light good. And all the way through the Bible, the light is good, the light is good, the light is good, the light is good. All the darkness in the world cannot extinguish the light of even one candle. But yet only 20% of the world believes in Yeshua. So what is it? It's a dark world. Do we say then when somebody, uh, you know, when, when you close a coffin cover, are they now entering the light? Well, you know, that's, that seems to be in the world, that's a time of darkness. But for the believer, it's a time of celebration. It's a time of graduation. It's a time of entering into pure light as opposed to the darkness and the, the mysterious trap of death. It says, death, O oh death, where is your sting? We need to understand this story. We need to understand the fear that entered into man at the same time sin entered. These are simultaneous events. And the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Now, nakedness in and of, of itself, the human body is beautiful, but it is for a private matter. Listen, the world was told uh, that this, this uh, uh, shamelessly exposing the body is connected with idolatry. We read about that in Exodus. We read about it, uh, about drunkenness. We, we know that, what was it, that uh, they looked upon Noah's naked body. Yes? Okay. Well, this is, not an, this is a private matter, not a public matter. These uh, uh, nude beaches and this uh, promiscuity and this imagery. Listen, pornography, which is an a, uh, uh, eye-gate matter, we're very visual people. Many of you are visual learners. You learn more from a picture than you do from the spoken voice. The impression, you may not remember the words, but you remember the visual. And the visual is emblazoned on your brain, and it's hard for men especially to erase that. Very hard. And so public nudity is, a, is associated with idolatry. Well, why? 
Well, you take a look at those pictures of uh, David, the sculpture, and it's always naked. And so you have these images that man's created to glorify the human anatomy, glorify the human body, the Adonis, the, uh, look, all these uh, fitness places. Look, they're not about uh, cardio. They're not about uh, your cardiologist is writing your prescription. You want that buff, six-pack body. You want to be. You want to regain your youth, recapture your youth. You want to get yourself in physical shape, where you would be admired by people, because that's the model that they use. How many of you go work out? Listen, you know my my position. When I have the urge to work out, I lay down until it passes. Somebody just told me that they wanted to run a 5K, and I said, is somebody chasing you? I really don't understand this concept of of artificial exercise. Go out there and work in your yard. Go out there and uh, plow the field and split the wood and do stuff that God instructed us to do. But but huddling up over it, uh, and I'm not not a fan. I mean, we have a membership so that we can say we have a membership. Right, Miss Laura? There you go. All right, now, what else entered into it? This statement is quite powerful, and he said, I heard your voice in the garden, I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Why do you hide? Shame. Fear, shame entered in with sin. I've had many, many, many people sit in my office with their head hung low. I see many people walking around like this. That's the picture of shame. Come on, look me in the eyes. No, if you can't make eye contact with me, if you can't look right into my eyes when I talk to you, when you turn your eyes away, I know something's going on with you. And you can only handle it for a little while trying to push yourself through to make eye contact with me, but most who are involved in sin turn away. Now, I'm big about eye contact. Miss Laura will tell you, I'm big about looking you right in the eyes and talking right to you, okay? And most people, they're automatically, they start to squirm a little bit. Because we've been taught about condemnation. We've been taught about shame. We've been taught about if somebody looks me right in the eye, I must have done something wrong. No, I look at you because I'm really interested in seeing who you are. Not about reading you. That's some uh, new age uh, hoo-ha that says, oh, I can look in your eyes and I can read you. No, I can read your eye, your mascara. You know, it's a lovely shade, but I, I mean, there's, what do you mean reading somebody? Now, if I look into your eyes, the eyes are the eye gates. When I make eye contact with you, the Lord may give me a word of knowledge. That's exactly what is supposed to happen as we connect through the eye. I see your facial expression. I see your reaction. I see whether or not you turn away. Well, I have a question. Why are you turning away? Oh, Rabbi, you you just know everything about me. No, I just looked at your face and you turned away. (laughs) But this is what happens. This is shame, hiding ourselves. We hide our eyes. We half-mast it, we turn away, we get distracted, we look over the shoulder, we don't make eye contact. Eye contact is good. This is acknowledgement. Most people are very distracted. Look, I confess, I'm a very distracted person. If you're in my office, my phone will ring, all of them, the one on top of my desk, the one in my pocket, the one in my backpack, they will all ring. My email will bing and bong. My text message will bing and bong. Someone will knock on my door. And unless you really say, Rabbi, this is important, and then you'll see me go, turn this off, turn this off, turn this off, turn this off, turn this off. But I'm a very distracted individual. Someone, someone sat in my office while I was multitasking. Multitasking for me is five things at one time. And they said, well, that's just amazing. I've never seen that before. Well, you've never seen a totally, completely, 100% distracted person that can only focus one second on five things, and so in five seconds I can do five things. Well, that's because I'm so distracted. But if you make eye contact with me, and I know that it's as important to you as it is to me. See, I have many people in my office. They're in my office just because I ask them in my office. 
They talk about their problem, but they want it to be more important to me than it is to them. They don't want to architect the solution. They don't want to be a, a, a participant in the solution. They just want a quick answer. No, you have to participate. It has to be as important to you as it is to me. Marriage counseling, premarital counseling, all these things that you must go out and do. Listen, I won't marry you unless you come to me for counseling. There's a number of couples here that said, okay, uh, what do we have to do to get married? Well, you have to come to counseling. And you've got to be a believer. And I don't marry non-believers. And I don't marry anybody that won't come for counseling. And that's just that simple. Right? And it's not a long, drawn-out counseling, but we're going to talk about all those things. We're going to talk about the baggage. We're going to talk about old relationships. We're going to talk about all that stuff. And we're going to come to an understanding that you're marrying the entire family, not just the person sitting across from you. You're marrying the whole family. And even if they've been estranged for 20 years, the minute the phone rings and mom calls for the first time and says she needs something, somebody's going to drop everything they're doing, including you, and go run after it because they're desperate to have mom in relationship. And we're going to talk about that. Are you prepared that when that estranged relationship is now repaired, that you're moving to the back burner for just a little while? Whoa. Is that really true? Yes, that's really true. Thank you very much, <laughs> Pastor Conrad. <laughs> because these things are true, whether you like them or not. Some things are true, whether you like them or not. Some things are true, whether you believe them or not. And so we're going to talk about those things. People who have been married before, people who have been divorced, people who have children through other marriages. Listen, this is tough stuff. This is real life. You can't get to be 50 or 60 years old without having, unless you've been married all your life, without having some stuff that you're dragging around like a ball and chain into your relationships. But we require that. Shame, fear, sin, they all go together. You can't have sin without the associated fear and shame. How many of you are very vocal about your sin? None of you. How many of you are willing to confess your sin? Just a couple of you. See, this is the interesting part about the Word of God. It says, confess your sins one to another, and God is faithful to forgive you your sins. See, this was the birth of confession, right? that you would tell it to one person. Listen, you can tell it to your best friend. You can tell it to your spouse. If you'll just go ahead and confess your sin, God is faithful to forgive your sin. You're going to have to work it out. But imagine what it's like when the betrayal sets in and when somebody finds out and then you're confronted. That's a whole different story, isn't it? Isn't that where the backpedaling and the denial comes in? Oh, uh, I heard your voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Oh, I heard your accusation. What's this text message on your phone? Who's so-and-so? And now you begin to backpedal, you begin to hide because you were afraid. And shame sets in because you were doing something you weren't supposed to be doing. This is what happens. We begin to cover up. Look at Washington, look at politics, look at the pulpit. As these people begin to cover up, cover up, cover up. Why? Because Genesis chapter 3, verse 10, reveals it all. He said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Fear, shame, sin, all go together. Vayomer mi higid lecha ki irom ata hamin haet asher tziviticha lebitil achol miminu achalta. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Uh, Victor Slater has a book entitled, Who Told You You Were Naked? It's all about this. <clears throat> Jewish, little Jewish guy with a long white beard wrote this book, Who Told You You Were Naked? It's all about sin entering in the world. It's all about this condemnation. It's all about how things are revealed that we buy into. The false report, the lie. How many of you listen to the news? Come on, raise your hand. Okay. How many of you believe the reporting that you hear? Come on, I know you believe it. 
I just had this conversation, Don Rankin and myself in my office, saying that uh, most people believe that if it goes out over the news, or if it's in the newspaper, it's ver validated, it's verified, and they would not print it or say it if it was not true. I have three words to say to you. ba lo -ni. Baloney. The only thing I can tell you is that every book written that has a man's name on it should be entitled, My Opinion by So-and-So. That's why you have to sort through and only embrace the Word of God as the only true and valid source for the truth. Who told you that you were naked? And the minute that God asked the question, He then went to the revelation. Do you not think He knew? Do you think he was surprised at this occurrence? That he was an investigative reporter saying, well, let me ask you a couple questions. Uh, who told you you were naked? Uh, have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you that you should not eat? Do you not think he already knew that? The entire point of this is that, listen, you'll sit in my office. I'll ask you a lot of questions that I already know the answer to. Because the question is, will you be honest in your reporting? The question is not about the, the, the question or whether or not I don't know. The question is, what will you do when you're asked that question? Listen, years ago, I was attached to a lie detector. I was put in a position where I had to verify and validate through scientific means that I was telling the truth. It's a very humbling and very humiliating experience. It's a very fearful experience. Because even though you're telling the truth, what if they don't know using their science that you're really telling the truth. Oh, can you beat the box? You know, you begin to look at all those things. And so I was scheduled for this lie detector test. And they hooked me up to this lie detector test and the, the uh, examiner is behind me and he begins to ask me questions. Is your name uh, Eric Walker? Well, actually, I don't know if my name's Eric Walker or not. Somebody told me that was my name, but how would I possibly know that that's really my name. Maybe that's not really. So I begin, because I'm a thinker. You know, I'm a process and goes, hold on a second, stop thinking. And I'm going, the guy's behind me. He's not looking at me, but he's reading this machine. He goes, listen, don't think about these things. Just answer yes or no. Is your name Eric Walker? You know, to be honest with you, I don't know. I've seen the paper. He goes, no, 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 no. <laughs> right. He said, I'm trying to establish, is there anything that you can answer yes or no to? And I said, yes. He said, okay, at least we're getting to the point where we're getting a baseline. All he was trying to do was establish a baseline, but he was asking me a question, and I was so concerned about giving the right answer that I didn't want to go into giving him information that may not be valid because then he'd say I was a liar. So is your name Eric Walker? I don't, you know, I don't know. I've seen my father's paperwork, and it changed, and he changed the name, and maybe it's not my name. That's what they told me. That's what they called me. But, you know, how, do you, how does anybody know for sure if that's really your name? And then I have a Hebrew name given to me at eight days old. And, and did they call me Eric before that, or did they call me Avraham? Maybe they didn't talk to me at all. I don't really know. <laughs> and I said, look, okay, let's start over again. So he put down the machine, and he got across the table, and he looked at me, and he said, listen, just calm down. Just, just calm down. Is your date of birth January the 6th? You know, I don't know. That's what they tell me. That's what they put on a piece of paper. But how could I possibly know for sure? Yes, I was there, but I can't confirm that. He's going, okay, here, here's a sheet of paper with baseline questions. Would you just circle a question that you're willing to answer yes to? He said, take your time. I said, I will. <laughs> so we found a couple of questions that would establish a baseline for them being true. So he began to ask me questions. He said, and so we got to the situation. He goes, uh, <clears throat> Is it possible? <laughs> that there's something you could have done to cause this. I begin to weigh into every possibility, every scenario flashing through my line. You know, the seed of doubt's now been planted, and he stops and he gets something to table and goes, Look, this is just like the yes or no question that I asked you before. Don't think about it. Just answer yes or no. He said, you have one second to answer. And he ran back to the table and goes, is it possible? No! <laughs> he said, okay. So we finished it up, and it was verified that I was telling the complete and total truth, even through this entire ordeal. But I was drenched. 
upon examination, I was extremely nervous because we all have that fear. You know, God says, settle your matters quickly with your adversary on the way to court. Why? Because you might be handed over to the judge, right? and the judge may rule against you even if it's true. You're subjecting yourself to the will of man. Here I was being interrogated, and this was the ultimate form of interrogation. You are strapped to a machine. There's something wrapped around your, your waist here. There's suction cups all over you, leaving all these weird marks. And you don't know what he's reading. He could have been reading a, a book. You have no idea what's on his computer. You've been making the whole thing up. You have no idea. Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded that you should not eat? And here was Adam's response. Vayomer ha'adam, ha'isha asher natata imadi, hi natli, nat nali, min ha'etz ve'akel. And the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. Fear, shame, evasion, and blame. He immediately takes no responsibility. He shifts that spotlight right over to the woman. And what's he say? The woman you gave me. So now he's making God a participant in the responsibility for his sin. Pretty crafty, isn't it? It's a whole lot contained in these simple words that just seem to be on the paper that we, when we read them, we don't really understand the true impact of what's being said here. He finally admits at the end of the statement that the woman you gave me, she did this, and so I'm just a victim. I ate, and I was victimized by the woman and by you. How many of us want to blame God for our problems? How many of us have been in situations where we don't like where we are and we get angry with God? You're the one that told me to do this. I thought I heard from you. You put me, if you know everything, then how come you let me get into this situation? You're to blame. Everybody's to blame. This is why we must confess our sins one to another. And he is faithful to forgive us our sins. Even if I confess my sin to you of how I sinned against you, it says he's faithful to forgive us our sins. You may not be so faithful as to forgive me what I did, but the fact that I've come clean, I've taken responsibility. It's a big problem in the world today, especially in these counseling situations where people come into my office and they talk all around the fact that they did something. They talk all around the fact that they were responsible. So I listen to the husband or the wife and then I look at them and say, is that an accurate account of what you did? And then I tell them, this is only acceptable answers are yes or no. That's it. Anything else is a lie from the pit of hell. Either you did it or you didn't do it. Is that a correct assessment of what took place? In 99% of the time, there's no embellishment. It's just fact. And yeah, he jumped on top of me. He did this or he pushed me or he did this or he did that. Or yeah, he took the money and he hit it. Or he had another cell phone and I didn't know about it. And he's been having a relationship with his uh, so-and-so. Is that true? Yes or no? And, and to be honest with you, I have no attachment. It's not that I don't care. It's just I have to have a clinical view of this circumstance and they're coming because they can't work it out together. What they need to do is they need to move it into a neutral because I have no agenda other than seeing the two of them get right with each other and with the Lord, and the Lord first. I'm not a proponent of divorce or separation or uh, burying the hatchet in the back of someone's head. Reconciliation comes about when both parties move towards an understanding that yes, the sin occurred, but can you move to the point of forgiveness? Is there an unpardonable sin in a marriage? Well, that's up to the individuals. See, that becomes a matter of personal choice. You can stand on the word, and adultery is an acceptable, if you can't forgive it, that is acceptable grounds, according to the Bible, 
or if the unbeliever leaves, it's acceptable to let them go. But is this God's ultimate desire? Rabbi Shaul makes it very clear to us that all things are lawful, but not all things are beneficial. Are you really going to give up? Is there no help? Is it so hopeless? And if it's so hopeless, then are we beginning to judge another in a way that we don't want to be judged? How much more or less significant is our sin? The sin of omission or the lie that we told or didn't tell or the thing we didn't disclose or not disclose? Are we now adjudicating and, and pointing the finger of condemnation based on this wrestling with an inner Pharisee that says that your sin's greater than mine and I'm going to withhold forgiveness? I still believe that people who can't forgive have forgotten what they've been forgiven of. And the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. The third reference, the third person in this picture, first God, you gave her to me, then the woman, she gave it to me, then I ate. Look at me, I'm the victim. What choice did I have? I trusted you to give me somebody that was going to look out for me, and they poisoned me. I'm just a helpless little victim here. All I did was eat. That's it. What's so wrong about that? You're the one who gave her to me. Didn't you know that she was going to do this vile thing to me? You're responsible, God. You did this. Isn't this the attitude we take? You know, when we were in uh, Ukraine, Rabbi Sasha, who you'll meet in January, preached a message, and he said that uh, a sign over the rabbi's door should say, instead of chief rabbi, it should say chief disappointer. Because you come into the office saying, Rabbi, I want you to validate what I've done. I want your approval for what I've done. He goes, no, I hate to disappoint you, but... And that happens more often than you know. How many of you, you don't have to raise your hands, have come up for prayer and said, Rabbi, I want you to agree with me? And I'll, I say to you, oh, well, you tell me what it is. I'll let you know if I agree. I know what you want. You've made that very clear. You want my agreement. Now tell me what it is, and I'll let you know whether I agree. You ever gone down for prayer and asked somebody to agree with you? I'm sure you have. Here, come agree with me about this. Well, I'm Lick all your hands say, let me know what it is before I commit to agreeing with you. And some of you I've said, no, I don't agree. <laughs> I don't agree. Chief disappointer. <laughs> Rabbi Sasha. He has another great line that says, uh, stop torching yourself, die quickly. <laughs> that was in this sermon to 200 leaders of congregations. Stop torching yourself, die quickly. I think it's a great line. Where's Alice? Alice, you getting t-shirts made? All right, we've got to make it. January 4th, he'll be here, and we want to uh, greet him with that message. Because imagine somebody preaching a message that says, stop torturing yourself, die quickly. But it makes so much sense, because we do torture ourselves. We do go through this, this uh, blame game. So where we finished up last week, Vayomer Adonai Elohim Laisha, Mazor Asit, Vatomer ha'isha, hanachash, hishiani, ve'achel. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me, and I ate. First the blame, then the shame. She blamed the serpent. See, had she said, yes, I did this, I ate, Lord, I was lured into a false sense of security, it convinced me that that's not exactly what you meant, and uh, I did it, and I'm really sorry. That's a huge mistake on my part, I shouldn't have listened to him. No, what'd she do? Blame the serpent, and then took as little responsibility, it's, just, it's not even responsibility, it's just a, yes, I ate. 
Verse 14, Vayomer Adonai Elohim, El hanachash ki asita, zot aror ata mikol habichema, umikol chayat, chasadei al gichoncha, telech va'afar tohol kol yemai cha yecha. And the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon your belly shall you go, and dust shall you eat all the days of your life. Who told you God does not curse? Blessings and curses from God, choices. Blessings and curses are introduced in Genesis, so we might understand the pattern of God. Does the serpent still crawl on its belly to this day? You who believe in evolution, why haven't they grown legs and walked upright? Because God cursed them all the days of their life. God cursed them. There are blessings and there are curses. If you take a look at the seven days of creation or the six days and the day of rest, God blessed and now God curses. Yes, loving and fair God, reasonable God, blesses and curses. And now he tells us to make our choice. This day I set before you blessings and curses, life and death. Choose life. It is our choice. And we cannot blame God for our choices. This is the story of Genesis, is the separation, the path of separation, and the path of return. Everything in Genesis became separated. Everything. Heaven from earth, light from dark, land from water, heaven below and the heaven above. Man from God, woman from man. All these things were separated. One book tells you about separation. Sixty-five books give you the path of return. Got a question? No. No question. And dust shall you eat all the day of your life. Vayavah ashit becha uvein ha'isha Uvein zaracha, uvein zara hu, yeshucha, shufcha, rosh, veata, teshufenu, akev. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. It shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. How many know that this is a messianic prophecy? This is about Yeshua. How many understand that women do not have a seed? Women have ovaries. They have eggs. A woman does not have a seed. A seed equates to a fertilized entity already placed within her. How did this seed get inside of her? Well, if you read the book, Eitz Chaim, Lessons Learned from the Tree of Life, you'll see that my opinion is that when God created Eve from Adam's rib, He placed it in there. That's, thus, we take a look at the story of the Methuselah seed that laid dormant for 2,000 years, and upon the right catalyst, the right environment, the right series of events, burst forth and bore fruit. A seed can lay dormant for 2,000 years. If it can lay dormant in the natural for 2,000 years, why can it not lay dormant in the lineage of women? Are all women descendants of Eve? Anybody not a descendant of Eve in this room? All women are descendants of Eve. So what are the, what are the chromosomes, X and, X and Y? I never really understood all that X and Y stuff. And then what's the other one? X and X? Y and Y? 2XY squared. (laughs) 
solve for X? I don't know. But it lay dormant within her until the visitation of the Holy Spirit. Uh, yesterday, Pope Benedict uh, released his third installment of his story of the life of Yeshua, and in there declares again that a foundational truth of faith in Messiah is the virgin birth, that it is fundamental to your faith in Messiah. In my opinion, there's only one explanation as to how this could possibly happen, and it references the seed of Genesis, the seed in the woman. This is the messianic prophecy, and this is the introduction of the anti-Messiah spirit into the world. And if you understand the fundamental nature of this curse, there will be enmity between the seed of the woman, Yeshua, and the seed of the serpent, which is Satan. Satan now knows who will crush his head and how he will die. So what would you do if you had a death sentence and you knew who your executioner was? You would do everything you could to buy more time, buy more time, buy more time. We know the prophecy said he will be of the line of David. David was a Jew. Therefore, if you want to eliminate this lineage, you'd kill the Jews, wouldn't you? If you kill the Jews, you get rid of the line of David, don't you? There is no line of David. So you enlist somebody like a Pharaoh that says, sure, let's kill all the boys. Well, the women, you see, it's a modern interpretation that the Jewish woman or the lineage or the, or the determination of if a child is Jewish is because of the mother. That's a modern interpretation that came about in 200 A.D. After the Romans raped and pillaged and impregnated Jewish women, well, you could determine who the mother was through the baby bump, but you couldn't always know who the father was. Therefore, if you knew it was a Jewish woman and she gave birth to the child, then the identity and the lineage of the child was Jewish. In order to establish the lineage of the child through the father, you had to know who the father was and know his lineage. So today we do it through last name recognition. Levine, Levi, uh, Cohen, Khan, C-O-H-N, K-H-N, all those names determine a Levitical lineage from the tribe of Levi. What about all the other names? Who knows? The only ones that have been protected over time are the Kohanim. And in fact, there's even DNA testing now that they've tested enough Jewish people with the name Kohn, Khan, Levine, Levi, Levi, all those names that they now have a database of a uh, genetic factor in DNA testing that can determine whether or not you, have, you test positive for the genetic marker that says that you could be not are, but could be, of Jewish descent from a Kohanim. Now, that means if my DNA were tested, I probably would not have that marker. I'm not a Levi or a Levine or any of those names. I'm a, a Vovovich from a uh, line of Aaron Price, and Aaron Price would have been a Levitical name, but that was on my grandmother's side. And so it would have to come through my father, who was probably Gad or uh, something else. My wife thinks that because we're prickly on the outside but soft on the inside, that that was, a, that was the tribe of Gad. And you know what? I've got to agree with that. I've got some rough edges. I'm happy about that. You know, I plead guilty to being a strong leader, but I have a soft heart. But in order to understand this messianic prophecy... We now see everything unfolds that throughout history, Satan has enlisted people whose purpose was to annihilate the Jewish people. Yes, Conrad, Dr. Baggett. Regarding the seed of the woman, then why in Luke does it say that the Holy Spirit came and overshadowed, that's the King James Version, Mary? Because I was taught until I came here that that was the impregnation by the Holy Spirit well, in Mary. Right. 
you know, and that's, a, that's another explanation, but I would say that it was the catalyst. A visitation of the Holy Spirit is a catalyst. So taking that seed that was found in Qumran with the Dead Sea Scrolls that lay dormant for 2,000 years, when you activate it, when you put it at the right catalyst, which the right, right catalyst for it was earth, sunlight, and water, when you had those three catalysts applied to it, it now bursts forth with life and bore fruit. So the dormancy, right? Now, uh, let's see, I've had a visitation of the Holy Spirit, but I'm not pregnant. Anybody else here had a visitation of the Holy Spirit and got pregnant? Craig? Pregnant with hope. All right. Uh, That's nice. But uh, so where is she? (laughs) Where, Where is your daughter Hope? right there. I agree. I agree. You see, we have the intangible, and there's many, many instances of a visitation of the Holy Spirit, and with the same testimony of, I had a visitation of the Holy Spirit, and I was healed. I had a visitation of the Holy Spirit, and I had revelation. And you can find confirmation for all that, but you only have one instance in the Bible that produced that result. So would it just be a visitation of the Holy Spirit who impregnated, because there's no other evidence of an impregnation ever happening before or after that occurrence, but we can take a look at things of the natural, a seed which lay dormant for 2,000 years, and given the right catalyst, the right visitation, the right activation. All right? How do we know that? Because we know that when uh, uh, we read in our Torah portion last night from uh, what was that Torah portion, Laura, of uh, uh, Let's see. Um, it was uh, Jacob's ladder, right? the visitation, the uh, a- angels dece- ascending and descending. Uh, we know that that was an activation of the Holy Spirit that brought about what? Right? That, that opens the gates of heaven, that this visitor, he didn't get pregnant. Right? But he saw the Son of Man ascending the angels, and the Lord said, this is surely the place. He declared that this is uh, the house of God. So we, we see only one instance of a visitation of the Holy Spirit that, impregnate, that impregnated. We have no other testimony, no other verification of that ever happening before or happening after that. So why was that a unique experience? But we do have activation. We have activation of faith. We have activation of revelation. We have activation of knowledge. We have activation of encounter. All with the same visitation of the Holy Spirit. So was this a different Holy Spirit? Well, if there was a different Holy Spirit than the one that Yeshua said would come, who would be the counselor, the comforter, this, this Ruach HaKodesh, would bring about a pregnancy. Yes, I'm pregnant with faith. Okay, but I didn't give birth to a child. Yes, I'm pregnant with hope, but I didn't give birth to a child. Well, I'm pregnant with joy, but I didn't give birth to a child. So must it have been in there all along, and that was activated. I find that to be a more plausible explanation. I cannot give you biblical verification. These are the kind of things that I encourage all of you to have a pad of paper by your bed and to write down questions you want to ask God when you get there. These are some of those questions, you know, because there's many things in the Bible that are not explained. There's revelation. For instance, uh, people ask me about, are we in the end times? Well, I believe that we are, because of the fig tree blossoming, because of Israel and the timelines. Well, when will it happen? Well, the Hebrew year is calendar is 5773, but there are some missing years in Daniel. So how many missing years are there? Well, I tell people that the, uh, at the shortest onset, based on what I can tell, to get to six, the year 6,000 biblically, which would be the end of six years, a day is like 1,000 years, that would be the end of 6,000 years, beginning a 1,000-year reign, the minimum would be 13 years and possibly up to 30 or 35. So do I know that for sure? I have no idea. Sounds good. It's uh, Y6K. I'm looking forward to it. I never understood the Y2K stuff because God certainly never adopted the Julian calendar. Yes, sir? Pregnancy thing. I was just trying to raise my hand to get the microphone. So, sorry about that. Question on uh, becoming or being a Jew. Um, If a person converts to Judaism, how do the Jewish people, if you're a Gentile converting to Judaism, 
how do they respond to that or what's the answer is that person truly a jew since it's not of the bloodline according to traditional judaism yes for instance when uh, what, what they do is actually through traditional conversion is that part of that process is to recite the words of ruth that says your people will be my people your god will be my god where you live i will live where you die i will die and that is actually the prayer of conversion however uh, we don't support conversion because it says scripturally that out of the two, God will make one. He doesn't say that everybody becomes a Jew and everybody comes. What you do is out of those two, you become one in Messiah, grafted in. You have to have both parts in order to make the one. Uh, conversion, in my opinion, uh, says to God, uh, you made a mistake. You didn't make me Jewish, but I'm going to fix that. Well, wait a second. Uh, if you don't have to convert, or I, for instance, I didn't, I didn't convert. Uh, Paul didn't convert. There's no word in Scripture does it talk about Paul's conversion. Paul converted to become a believer, but converting to what we call Christianity today, uh, the definition of Christianity uh, originally was a follower of Yeshua. Okay, well, for that definition alone, I meet the requirement. But you go one word past that, and I divorce myself from what is referred to as Christianity. Why? Because it carries with it the same set of pharisaical rules that Torah-observant Judaism comes with it. Well, you either have to be baptized through immersion, and if you're not baptized through immersion, well, what about the sprinklers? What about the splashers? What about the dunkers? All right. well, okay, well, which one? Oh, now they have rules about this. What about the length of your, of your skirt? What about dancing? What about alcohol? What about uh, musical instruments on Sunday? You can have many other day of work, but, but Sunday is holy, and you can't play musical instruments on Sunday because you have to make music in your heart. Well, this is denominational rules, and, you know, I've misquoted because today uh, I've told you there's 28,000. Well, since I started reporting there were 28,000, 7,000 new denominations have entered the world. And now there are 35,000 Christian denominations, and it becomes further subdivided, 35,000 different sets of rules and regulations for observance. Yeshua made it clear, a house divided against itself cannot stand. You have division. And you still have approximately, and the numbers keep changing, but 60 to 70 percent have an underlying, churches have an underlying theology or doctrine which is replacement theology that says that God broke it that because the Jews broke their covenant with God the church is now Israel well if you even have the slightest inkling that that might be true go online and listen to last night's message because I think that I made it biblically and evidently clear beyond a shadow of a doubt that God acknowledged Israel's disobedience and said, I'm not doing it for their sake, I'm doing it for my name's sake, that I will restore them and they will be a nation. Yes? Well, <clears throat> I was just going to say, why would God have put the story of Hosea in the Bible if that replacement theory was true? Because uh, he would be saying Hosea was more righteous than him. I mean, all the old stories tell us a picture of Christ. And so that shows us right there that the replacement theology is wrong. Amen. You know, the, these are questions, in my opinion, people who promote replacement theology have never read the Bible. They threw out the Old Covenant. So you can't throw out the Old Covenant because without the Old Covenant, you have no Yeshua. If you throw out the Jewish people, this is what the Bible would look like. If you take all the Jewish authors of the Bible, this is what the Bible would look like. It'd be a blank sheet of paper. There would be no Bible if it wasn't for the Jewish people, both the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And when you look at Messianic Judaism, Messianic Judaism are the reporters and the authors of the New Covenant Scriptures that introduce the world to the Messiah. And so if you have a belief in the Gospel of Mark or Matthew, or Luke, or John, then you are taking the testimony of a Messianic Jew and basing your faith on that testimony. 
And last night we talked about John, not the Baptist. John the Levite, the Kohanim, the lineage of the high priest who was immersing in water as a Levitical action because it required cleansing and the rabbis taught and believed that what you took into that water did not come back out, that when you went into the mikveh pool and you were immersed, tevila, that what came out of it was a new creation. So what you read in, in 2 Corinthians 5.17 is a testimony to rabbinical teaching. And so John the rabbi, not John the Baptist, John the rabbi, right? as much as I love my Baptist brothers and sisters, and Pastor Conrad is a Baptist minister, a pastor of a Baptist congregation, and J.C. is an elder or the head of the deacons of uh, Dawson Memorial Baptist Church. And so, as much as I would love to have him be a uh, Baptist, he was a Jew. He was a Levite. He was the last of the Old Testament prophets. Because remember, during his lifetime and his death, Messiah was still alive. And therefore, because Messiah was still alive, the new covenant had not come into being. He walked this earth, and you had faith in him. But until the final sacrifice was made, the Levitical system was not made complete. And therefore, John not the Baptist, John the rabbi, was the last of the Old Testament prophets. Ooh, revolutionary teaching. But factual, biblically factual. Just because he's talked about in the New Testament does not mean that he was not an Old Testament prophet. He was the last of the Old Testament prophets. I know I'm shaking your world, but praise God, because it's true. All right, so we see this messianic prophecy where else do we see Messianic prophecy? We know that only a man walks in a garden. The Spirit doesn't walk. The Hebrew word halak refers to walking. That is the Hebrew word for walk. As a matter of fact, halakha, which is Jewish law, and what's taught in the, the uh, rabbinical circles of traditional non-Messianic Judaism is what's called halakha. It is the way of life, the way of Jewish life and observance of Jewish law. It's the way you walk. How many of you say that you walk with the Lord? Not enough of you. How many of you say that you walk with the Lord? Okay. How many of you would like to walk with the Lord that aren't walking with the Lord? Well, that's called halakha, but not in the Jewish traditional rabbinical interpretation of halakha. It has to do with actually walking, doing more with God, not doing more for God. It is your faith walk with the Lord. So these are the messianic prophecies contained in Genesis. If you throw Genesis out, you have no foundation for faith in Yeshua if you eliminate Genesis. You cannot stand on a faith in the Messiah if you aren't introduced to the Messiah in Genesis. This enmity, this introduction of Hasatan, Satan, the accuser of the brethren, he is not an enemy of God. God doesn't, how, how God created an enemy. Well, then he's not sovereign. If, if, if uh, Hasatan, who was created, it says in Isaiah that God formed the light and created the darkness then it was God himself that introduced evil into the world. Okay, I'm fine with that, because we have to make a choice. Bob Dylan, who's also named, uh, uh, actually he's, he's uh, Robert Zimmerman, uh, the Messianic Jewish boy known as Bob Dylan, uh, wrote a song that said, you've got to serve somebody. He's a Messianic Jewish believer but yet the world doesn't look at him as a Messianic Jewish believer. They look at him as Bob Dylan. But he's a Messianic Jew. And he wrote a song, You've Got to Serve Somebody. Didn't Yeshua actually write that song? He said, If you are not for me, you are against me. Friendship with the world is hatred towards God. Either you serve the Lord or you serve Satan. There is no neutral territory. There's no neutral way of life. Either you're actively for the Messiah or you are against him. Anything that's less than active, passive, doing nothing is an action. That's why they call it doing nothing. It is active. It's act, you're engaged in the action of doing nothing. 
not using your voice, is doing something. It is being silent, exercising silence. That's like an oxymoron. But this is what's happened to the body of Messiah. They're very active in doing nothing. Not making a stand. And Yeshua says, if you are not for me, and that means active, not passive, active, fully engaged in going out and making disciples of men, going out and letting your light shine, going out and showing your good deeds that, the, that, that man may see them and bring glory to your Father in heaven. James wrote, faith without works is death. Two things active there in Revelation chapter 2 to the church in Ephesus. I've seen your great works, but this I hold against you. You lost your first love, the Spirit. Faith. It must be faith at work. That's action. Verse 16. El ha'isha amar haba arba etzvonech leharonech Be'etzev, tel divanim, ve'el echshech, teshukatech, ve'chu yimsho bach. To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply the pain of your childbearing. In sorrow you shall bring forth children, and your desire shall be to your husband, and he shall rule over you. Anybody now understand the enmity between husband and wife? Everything that's been separated fights to return. And when I say fights to return, that's exactly what happens. When the heavens fight to return to the earth, what do we call it? A thunderstorm, rain, tornado, hurricane. It fights to return. The water fights to return, crashing waves upon the shore. The waves crash. They come, fight to return to the shore. Darkness fights to overcome the light. Look at the world today. Look at this celebration of Halloween. Prayer in school has been eliminated, but Halloween is a school celebration now. Darkness is overtaking light in many places. And now you see this man was to rule. What does that mean to rule? It means he's to be the head. I run things in my house. I run the vacuum cleaner, I run the dishwasher, and now I have a tractor, and I run that tractor, don't I? You ought to see me on that little tractor, it's pretty hilarious. My tractor is just a uh, bush hog, it just doesn't know it. It's just a little bitty tractor. Yeah, but I take it into places that no man would go. <laughs> I took it into the shop and they said, what have you been doing with this? I said, it's a tractor. I do whatever tractor. No, it's a lawnmower with four wheels and a steering wheel. No, it's not. It's from John Deere. It's a tractor. And if it says John Deere on it, it's supposed to go ahead and move mountains. And they said, well, uh, it looks like you ran into the mountain and your frame is bent. I said, I drove over that tree until it yielded. I figured once it hit the blades, it would cut it down. So I just, I ran it over until it bent, and then I drove up on it, and I, isn't that how you're supposed to do it? That's one way, All right. So they said, do you want us to straighten it? And I said, why? I'm just going to bend it again. I said, wait till it's really broken. They said, well, your lawn's going to be a quarter of an inch off. I said, are you going to tell anybody? It'd be a quarter inch higher on one side than the other side. I said, who cares? I said, I'm mowing a pasture. Do you think anybody really cares whether or not it's... I said, and then what I'll do is I'll just back up. I'll mow it this way and then that way, and it should even it out, right? He goes, no, it'll still be a quarter inch wrong. I said, oh, got a good point. Well, so if you come by our house, listen, turn your head. It'll look very even to you. We're happy with it, and I've knocked down a lot of trees with that little thing. If I had only known, I would have gotten one of those big ones. And then, and then, 
Miss Laura will send you pictures of it. So to the woman he said, I will greatly multiply the pain of your childbearing, and in sorrow you shall bring forth children. How many have ever seen a picture of a woman giving birth and tears are spread? Those are joys, tears of joy, right? No, that's pain, isn't it? And what's the most painful of the labor pains? Isn't it the last one? The last big push is the most painful? Well, when Yeshua talks about the birth pains, they come closer and closer together, right? As the baby's getting ready to be delivered, they come closer and closer together. And finally, then you have this big pain, but right after that big pain is the reward, and they call it the crowning. Isn't that interesting that your reward comes in the form of a crowning? And it's such a beautiful picture because God's telling us and Messiah is telling us that these birth pains, what's going to happen in that last big pain, will be followed by the crowning. The king will come. And he will take up his throne. How many liked it the first four months of pregnancy, but then after that they didn't like it anymore? You know, I hear that. Oh, the first months were great, but then this, or the middle trimester was the best. I could have stayed that way forever, but then it started getting. And then finally, about two or three weeks before, you ready? I am so ready. I am so ready. And then what happens? Then the crowning. And there's pure joy. Does any, can anybody recreate that pain? They cannot. God releases in all of us. You can tell the story about how you had your knee and it was turned upside down and it was laying in pieces on the floor and all these things, but you can't recreate the pain. That's how you know there's a God. It's because you can endure the most critical, crucial pain. Where's uh, Creighton? Creighton, uh, when you flipped over that, uh, that dump truck. Yeah, oh yeah, on my head. On your head, <laughs> okay. Went completely backwards. The, uh, what was it, the uh, bed yep. opened yeah, the on bed, its own. Yeah, the bed went up and caught the power lines and stretched them and turned the truck over. Ow. Oh. <laughs> but you can't recreate the pain, can you? Mm-mm. Okay, but you can describe it. Oh, yeah. Ow. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. And you know where he was three days later? Three days after he told me about how he flipped the... He was sitting right in here. Because he's a fool for God. Who's full of you? Testimony couldn't wait to get here so he could testify how God spared him from something that nobody should be able to walk away from. The bed of the dump truck hit a power line and flipped it over. Not like my little tractor. My little tractor, I flipped it into a ditch and I was able to pull it out. Not that time when I called the tow truck. That was in the lake. This was in the ditch the other day. But they had to pull the car out too. Because I tried to use the car to pull out the tractor and the car got stuck and the tractor went in. But I called AAA, didn't I? He said, listen, if you ever want to drive your tractor in the lake, why don't you call us first? Okay. I said, a tractor's covered? He said, well, the car's involved, so I can write it up that way. So I got a tow strap. Now I know how to do it. I don't have to get that close to the lake. I will greatly multiply the, chain your train, the pain of your childbearing, and sorrow you shall bring forth children, and your, and your desire shall be to your husband, and he shall rule over you. He is called to be the head, but my wife is the neck. She's the one that turns the head. This battle, this friction of who's the man, who's the man, who's the man, who's the man. Why is the man the ruler over his wife? Because he's supposed to die first. He's supposed to go into battle for the protection, for the kapoor, for the covering over the family. He's spiritually responsible for the condition of his family, whether he likes it or not. He's been elevated to the point. Well, who was accountable for the condition of Israel? It was the king. The king was held accountable by God for the condition of the people. 
If the people were idol worshipers, it was because the king did not demand them to break down the altars and to tear down the Asherah poles and stop sacrificing the idols, because the king didn't issue the edict in the land. And if the house is out of order, what happens? It says in Timothy that if a man wants to elevate, be elevated to a position, it's good to want to be in leadership. You have, must have your house in order. What does a house in order mean? God first, then your family, then your congregation and your work. A house in order means God first. There shall be no other gods before me. A house in order. And the man is to be the head of the household. Now we read later on that if a, if a, uh, a non-believer wants to leave, to let him go, but the woman may be the very reason that the man comes into the kingdom. And we see that a lot. We see that very, very much so in churches. We see it some here at Bethlehem where the woman takes the lead and pulls her husband through. And then if she's really doing her job, she's going to push him, push him to the forefront to take the lead, to be the spiritual head of the household. You know, many of you know the story of Miss Laura and I, the very first question I ever asked her in any conversation I ever had with her, the very first words out of my mouth for this beautiful young woman was, do you believe that the man should be the spiritual head of the household? What did you say? Yes. That was it. So then she asked me to marry her, and I did. Because <laughs> that's how things work in God's economy. I can't explain it, and I just tell you that that's how it happened. She'll confirm it. She's right there. Well, she actually sent me an email that said, there's a question I want you to ask me about marriage. It was very subtle. Carolyn, right up here. That's Carolyn Marshall, outstanding florist. If you need any floral work done, she'll do it. She designs, she creates, she assembles, and she's turnkey. She won't nickel and dime you. She'll just take care of all of it and give you a big bill. Isn't that right? Yes. But I'll work with you on that, right? I will. There you go. All right. Um, could you explain to me uh, why... Uh, having an urge for your husband and r him ruling over you, is that supposed to have been a curse? Wait, say that again for me. Put your mouth closer in the scripture, to the microphone. In the scripture where it says, yet your urge shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. Yes. Is that a, was supposed to have been a curse? From God to put, about... Put the, you've got to put the microphone right up to your mouth. Okay. Is that a curse? Yeah, where he said, yet your urge shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. Well, according, and, to, the, according to the women I talk to, it's a curse. But that's According God. to a lot of marriages, it seems to be a curse. Um, you, you know, you can explain a lot of things. This is, uh, uh, there's a lot of negativity associated with this, but in the biblical sense, this is actually supposed to eliminate, I only have, this, this is the wandering eye, this is adultery, this is all these things. Your desire shall be your hu for your husband, and he shall rule over you. He shall, you know, he's the provider, ruling over somebody. If we take a look at this from a kingly perspective as the ruler, the ruler of a kingdom is to provide for the benefit and the welfare of his kingdom. He's responsible for defense. He's responsible for provision. He's responsible for making sure that, the, the, that his, the welfare of the people is under his protection. Now, what man has done with that is he's now uh, the Archie Bunker of the house. And he says that Eve was made out of uh, his rib a cheaper cut of meat. You know, there's all these attitudes associated with it. But this was not to be a curse. This was to be, and there's this resistance. There's this battle. This is enmity between men and women because she's trying to return to the man, to be the man, to be a part with the man. But if you look at biblically what happens, for this reason a man will leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife and they shall become one. They should be operating as one. And he should be the head of the household. And he should rule over his house, meaning that he doesn't let sin, he doesn't let enemies, he doesn't let poison, he doesn't let um, uh, hunger or thirst or disease or sickness or vile creatures into his house. That he protects his wife, that he's a covering, a kapoor, 
over him. As God was our covering, the man is supposed to be a covering for his wife. Sally. We looked at this a few weeks ago with some ladies, and the word urge also implies a craving. And when we looked at that, we talked about how women sometimes crave so desperately the man who is to be their husband or the man who's their husband that we might put that craving above craving God. And that embodies the curse that would take our eyes off of the Lord and look for the natural. Um, so there's a, a sweet bitterness to that particular craving that God gave us. Okay. You know, anytime you get into the, uh, uh, all of these things we discuss are what I would consider being the extra-biblical commentary understanding of all these things from a life application perspective. Uh, you can take it as a blessing. You can take it as a curse. If you are in a healthy marriage, it's a wonderful blessing that the husband is the head of the household, the spiritual leader, that he hears from God. How do you know he hears from God? Because it's evidence you judge a tree by the fruit. All right, now are there greater producing seasons than other producing seasons? Sure there are. Does a tree always bear 267 apples? Or are there years where there's drought and the apples aren't as big and as luscious or as plentiful and then there's a season where there's great rain and there's a, a harvest, a bountiful harvest? Sure. There's seasons. Everything has a season. There can be a season in my marriage where my wife is, is uh, thinking that this is a, a curse, when I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing, when I'm not responding. This is a dance, and you're supposed to operate as one. What happens is division comes in, and you're not operating as one. If you're operating as one, then we see this example that Yeshua gives us. Can the eye say to the feet, I don't need you? No. No. All parts of the body, all things work together for good, Romans 8 and 28. This whole picture of the body, the family is supposed to be an embodiment of Messiah. Messiah is supposed to be there at the center of it. A cord of three strands is not easily broken. If the husband rules his household according to God, then he is a protector, he is a healer, he is a defender, he is a comforter, he is a shield. He's a banner. He's a champion. He's a champion for his wife. He's a champion for his children. He might be in the most thankless job he's ever been in and the most underappreciated. It doesn't say anything about appreciation. Your desire shall be to your husband and he shall rule over you. And then he says to Adam, Ule Adam, Amir, Amar, Ki Shamata, Lekol Ish Techa. Botachal mihaet asher sitviticha le mor lo, tochal mi menu arurar ha adama ba vurecha be et savon tuchlena ko yemi chayecha. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake, and sorrow shall you eat of it all the days of your life. The ground is hard to work. I can tell you, that little tractor. Ground is hard to work. Yes, after lots of years of tilling and toiling and fertilizing, and, and yeah, there are plentiful areas, but even in the most plentiful area, which is the Midwest right now, they're under, undergoing the worst drought in the history of history. So the most rich, fertile soil has no moisture, and therefore the crops are dying. So it's not a matter of just the ground, it's a matter of all things working, all those things being uh, in, in perfect harmony. All right, mark your Bibles that on 1123, 1124, we're